On this upcoming attractions episode of Midnight Double Feature, we talk about The Mandalorian episodes three and four, plus our reviews for 21 Bridges, Knives Out, and The Irishman. Full spoilers, so be aware. All this and more on this upcoming Tractors episode of Midnight Double Feature. And we're back. Another episode, another day. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good, dude. How are you doing? What's what's cracking? What's new? I'm all right. I'm um, a little bit of a sore throat today, so, so bear with us. Bit of a quiet week. Um, nothing too crazy with the news. A um, couple of quiet weeks, right? I mean, it's been well, it's it's been a fortnight now, right? Yeah. Um, it's funny. Usually, it's like we're trying to cut stuff out, but this week, um, we, it feels like we were struggling to just find stuff to talk about. So it's like fuck it, let's just talk what we fucking seen because there's been a lot. I feel um, that we have watched in the last fortnight, and I've had a good time. Yeah, it's been a it's been a busy busy couple of weeks in terms of watching. You, I'm like when we when we're low on content. Here's some behind the scenes for you guys. When we're low on content, I'm always like, I'm always like of the mindset of like, let's not like scrape the barrel and get <laughs> like like talk about shit that we're like totally like uninterested in. Like you know, because mm-hmm. then because then it's gonna be like we're we're like faking excitement or like we're we're faking interest in something. So it's like you know what. Let's just talk about the good shit. <laughs> Let's just talk and, about the shit that interests us. And to be honest, like I'm, I'm like I'm willing to talk about anything. So, <laughs> so right. and that's that's the, that's the problem. Yeah, it's like, all me. I, I, I'm the yeah. gatekeeper. <laughs> but yeah, like, I I I love saying I love I, you know I'm I'm equally opportunity when it comes to good or bad looking projects. I get just as excited talking about something that's fun that I really enjoyed as something I hated. <laughs> um, the, the problem is when they sit in the middle, that's when it gets really there. If it's, it's a very cookie cutter being there, done that, that's when it gets problematic for me because then there's nothing exciting to talk about, you know? You know, it's funny you mentioned that because like the, the four sort of big pieces of content we're going to talk about today, right? I'm like super high on three of them. And then one of them is literally like that middle ground that you're talking about right now. Mm. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> Spoiler alert, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, with that, let's use that as a segue to move on. But first, if you haven't liked Midnight Double Features Facebook page, what are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? Get the <laughs> fuck up and like that shit. Also, join our Facebook community group if you want to hang out with us. That's called The After Party. And like us on Instagram. Give us a five-star review on iTunes. And if it's not a five-star review, then go fuck yourself. Eat, uh, eat a dick. I, eat I don't know if we should talk dick. about it here, but uh, uh, we got our oh, very first dude. hater recently. Holy and shit, I, yes. It brought our community <laughs> together. Um, I love the fact that Colin posted that in the after party and all of a sudden the comments were just like amazing. So, you know what, a dude? weird it's, ego boost. It's kind of funny because like remember, remember two weeks ago when we were talking about, you know, the Snyder Cut and toxic fandom and all that shit. And then, yes. like, and then like literally like, the weekend after that, I talked about toxic fandom again on the Misery podcast. Uh, by the way, a uh, shout out to our, our boy Jose Rivera who left a great little a great comment under that post about toxic fandom. And then mm. like this uh, this asshole <laughs> because like I posted something and then he posted something in retaliation. You know, uh, it's it's about Star Wars, right? Let's you know yeah. let the cat out of the bag. It's about Star Wars, and he's like one of those salty fucking fanboys who's like Ryan. Johnson stole my childhood. <laughs> um, that's 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 his kind of mentality. And then you know he started bringing like you know personal shit into it. And I'm just like, yeah, you know what? See you, dude. There's like no room for that on the fucking after party. We're a fucking yeah. we don't we don't bring personal attacks into it. And like once it crosses that particular line, then it's just like see you fucking later. And then like he yeah. got so salty and he left a review like a negative review on our midnight double feature Facebook page, and like. It was just, it was just so hilarious the timing of it all because we, just, you know, we, we, we've been talking about toxic fandom for a while now, so it's fucking, yeah. it's great. And, and just so point. everyone understands, if you if you missed out on that, so you understand what we defined by uh, this this guy's behavior. He, he, we were literally called self righteous virgins, which is pretty yeah. hilarious. Um, I haven't been called a virgin in a while, so it was a nice refreshing insult so thank you it's i mean it's accurate dude it's, it's pretty accurate yeah. dude I'm, I'm, a, I'm, very, I'm very pure i'm very holy you know come on dude yeah. like <laughs> yeah. one with the lord saving one myself lord. from marriage yep. Cel- yeah. celibacy celibacy yeah <laughs> you, know, you know what the you know what the best form of safe sex is no sex 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Can't get AIDS that way. Nah. Uh. Right. Exactly. Uh, but honestly, like speaking about toxic fandom, we haven't put this in the in the uh, the list of things to do. But something I heard just the other day, which I found very interesting, you know how there's all this talk about how with the Sonic the Hedgehog movie they've redone the CGI to appeal for fans. Another film's done that. Apparently, Cats. Um, they haven't done a drastic redesign, but they have redesigned like the fur textures and stuff as a way to come back from like the backlash in a way. And I, it just, it's a sign of the times. I think this is what this inner generation has come to. I don't think this is the last time we're going to see this happen. And yeah, I think that's where we're at right now. To think that this Oscar, this movie that's clearly going for an Oscar is changing due to like internet comments on YouTube. That's pretty crazy, right? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, like I've got a lot of, uh, okay, well, yeah, you know what I'm going to say? I got a lot of faith in Tom Hooper as a director because I mean- um, he directed The King's Speech, and The King's Speech is a damn fucking fine movie. So um, I believe it won Best Picture as well. So um, I think I think you know as as bad. I mean, <laughs> as much as you do want to say, why does this project exist? It's kind of like, I mean, I'm I'm kind of like always throwing myself into projects because of directors alone, and like you know filmmakers mm. alone. So I I I'll I don't know if I'll see this opening day. I'll see it eventually. Um, definitely going to wait for the reviews, see which way they kind of slant, and then you know I'll make up my mind then. But yeah, it definitely is interesting um, to see how public reaction is kind of like resulting in absolute kind of you know reversals by studios or, or you know quick moves and things like that to kind of like appease appease. Not only fans, but like general audiences who might give it a bad word of mouth, you know? Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, the movie business is a business. They want to make a profit. So they need as good as, they need as good, what's the word of mouth as possible. Like that's, that's how it is. So it, it makes sense in a way. But yeah, that it's, I made a comment in the after party just today, which I think applies to this too about, uh, which you call the Dr. Doodle movie with Robert Downey Jr., where someone was like, oh, what? I think it was Carlos who was like, why does this project exist? And it's like, well, on paper, it probably sounded like a no-brainer. You talk, you got these massive actors, big pre-established franchise. It's done well in the past. Like, I could be talking about Doolittle. I could be talking about Cats. On paper, it sounds like a fucking smash hit. But sometimes with the execution, you can... Things can happen, but that movie still has a chance. I think, like, like you said, great director, great, like that cast You're alone. About I cats, think, not Doolittle. Yeah, I yeah. am. I am. Uh, <laughs> I think Cats will do better than Doolittle. I think it's safe to say that now. Oh, I Doolittle think so. looks. Oh man, that's guys. Not, yeah, let's. let's I not wish go down I don't want to spend path. too much time on this, but guys, if you like behind the scenes drama, do yourself a favor. Look up what's been going on with Doolittle. It is bonkers and i can't wait to just few more information that comes out that'll be crazy uh but that's on the schedule for today let's talk about what we actually want to talk about uh so it's been two weeks and the mandalorian has two more episodes we we love doing these breakdowns because we fucking love this show zoheb walk me through your your general thoughts of episodes three and four all right well let's talk the mandalorian So, episode three, man, holy shit, right? <laughs> like, that, yeah. that episode, I mean, you know, without without any pun intended, that episode came out guns blasting. Like, that that was fucking awesome. I love that you, you kind of- That was a, such an intentional pun. <laughs> hey, you, were so, yeah. you were so full of shit. That was so you know intentional. What? You, don't, you don't get to say <laughs> fuck you to me for puns if you get to do these shitty as, like, you know, segues. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You, okay. That, you don't get to do that. <laughs> noted. Noted. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was fucking awesome, dude. Like, but not not only is it like a tight, what is it, thirty five minutes? Um, it's it, it built the law pretty fucking well. Like mm. you know, we and I think I was, I think I kind of was right. Like that Amara is not his wife. Like it's his, yeah. it's his tribe. Like it's his kind of like you know they've they've taken me in. Um. You know, obviously that information is something we found out in episode four, but like they've taken me in. Um, I'm I'm part of this tribe. Like this is the way. Um, you know, yeah. we 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 uh, our our currency is our armor. Um, 
Man, it it was just just so fucking good. And like, you know, it it is predictable to kind of like see him go back for uh quote baby Yoda, unquote, but it was still fucking incredible. What what do you what did you think, man? Like let's I'll, I'll bounce off you with this one cuz I've I've been through quite a bit since I've seen that episode that third episode. <laughs> so, um, I'm kind of I've uh, forgotten a lot of it except the the big the big stuff. Well, if we're just talking about episode 3, it's definitely had the most, oh, the biggest highlight I think so far. That big, that massive action sequence, that amazing shot of all the uh, bounty hunters just flying back in. Sorry, not bounty hunters, Mandalorians flying in. That was absolutely incredible. Um, that was the first episode where I started to feel what you were saying last last episode about it feeling a little short. That's the first time I was like, ah, oh, it does feel short. The fact that it's like barely forty minutes. But I, I, I'm okay with it because it's a fucking great 40 minutes. Just while, but, while you're talking about it there, I didn't have yeah. that problem at all with the fourth episode. Like, Me I, too. I thought Me the too. fourth episode took its time and paced itself very, very fucking well. Yeah. And look, this episode, it kind of did everything we expected it to do. Um, it played out the way we assumed, I think, episode two could have gone if two wasn't so much of a filler. But I think we're starting to see what the sh- shape of the show is now. I like the fact that we're getting a bit more personality out of the Mandalorian character and we're getting more into the lore. I know a lot of the stuff I'm saying now kind of applies to episode four as well. But yeah, the, the, the biggest takeaway is the action set piece of this episode. It is bonkers. It is mind-blowing. And it sucks we've only got a few more episodes of these left, right? Yeah, we're halfway exactly now. So up to, after episode four, there's four more to go. Um I don't. I don't want to just like you know gloss over the smaller stuff that happened in that episode. Like you know, you obviously have that big action sequence at the end, but man, the stuff that leads up to that when he's actually uh, fighting his way to Baby Yoda, um, like the yeah. you know in the corridors in the dark. Like I love the what is what is what's the uh, what's the things that he lets loose the whispering fucking. Well, oh, there's something, they call them like birds or singing birds or something. I can't Whispering, remember. Yeah, some shit like that. But you know what but I mean. Whistle, cool whistling birds. Whistling, whistling birds. Yeah. It's yeah. cool to see him go all like Splinter Cell stealth, stealth oh, mode on dude. it. I don't when know he... if we've seen that, seen that in Star Wars yet. Have we, like, like to that degree. That's uh, cool. Not not to that degree. I mean, you know, he, he is a different character to characters that we've already seen on film. So mm. I think, you know, he like it kind of lends to the stealthiness of it a bit. Like it's a little it's a little better. Um, but man, like the scene where he <laughs> he he ropes that stormtrooper in and he stabs him in the back. Oh dude. <laughs> you have no idea the semen that just launched from my dick. Like, oh um, but like yeah, piercing that's, that's the armor. That's a little armor. too graphic. <laughs> Hey, we're an R-rated podcast, right? I, I um, also enjoyed the scene, but I enjoyed it in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> different ways? But yeah, it's it's cool to see, like, this dark take on Star Wars stay true to its darkness, even though it's got the cutest, most merchandisable character Killing out it. of anything. Killing like, it on it's, the it's, internet. It's like one of those, what are they called, smogs or whatever, or porgs, porgs. times like 20. Um, uh, and I've... I feel like these two episodes, they really do link well together in terms of Yoda memes that we can get out oh, of Oh, for sure. Um, don't want to go past the director for this episode as well. So the director who did episode three uh, is a woman named Deborah Chow. Deborah Chow is the showrunner for the upcoming Obi-Wan TV show. So, ah. yeah, if this is if this is an indicator of how that um, show is going to go down, then holy fuck am I fucking excited, dude. This was a great, great episode. Super tight. Yeah. Love it. Uh, let's move on to episode four. What do you think of episode four? Episode four might be my uh, most favorite episode yet. Um, I, I know I know a lot of people were like singing the praises for number three, but man, the fourth one for me just I loved like what you mentioned off air the seven samurai aspect of it. Like I want to give you credit for that because I definitely didn't <laughs> didn't pick up on that. Oh, I, love- I stole it. I, I saw it in some comment section somewhere. It's like, oh, <laughs> like, I'm not going to lie. I love, I love the gun, the lone gunslinger just coming in to save this, like, village um, from, you know, from, from fucking mercenaries, or not mercenaries, but, you know, marauders, um, and, you know, come to find out that they're being assisted with, you know, Empire tech, and it's a fucking ATST, and then, you know, you meet um, Gina Carano's character, and, you know, they form an alliance, and, 
The the whole time during this episode, it's the Mandalorian trying to find some kind of sanctuary. That's the name of the episode, Sanctuary. Um, he's trying to find some place to to hide this baby Yoda so he can be safe. Um, and it's such a simple, simple episode, but just done so incredibly, incredibly well. One of my favorite shots in the entire show is in this episode. It's the the red eyes from the ATST just lifting slowly up from the forest, the darkness of the forest. Holy shit, dude, was that incredible for me. Like, I was like, damn. Um, directed by Bryce Dallas Howard, which is fucking interesting because um, her father, Ron Howard, directed Solo, A Star Wars oh. Story. So I wonder how that went down. <laughs> but yeah, man, really, Fall really, back really you know. I know, really fucking enjoyed this episode, dude. I am so fucking hyped for what we have Still yet to come. I'm I'm kind of disappointed that we haven't seen Giancarlo Esposito yet, who, you know, Gus from Breaking Bad. Like, mm. oh, man, where where are you, dude? I need you. <laughs> I need you, man. I think we're only going to get him for one episode, I feel. The way the show... So this is the episode where I feel the structure of the show is kind of revealed. So at this point, we've had one episode based in lore, one that's kind of like a standalone, almost filler episode, and we've had one episode based in law that now now come to this like a standalone sort of filler episode. I feel like the word filler has a bad connotation to it. Uh, when I say filler, I mean it just doesn't advance the plot heavily. Uh, it's kind of more like a standalone story in a way. And I think that's like what the type of character archetype of like the lone gunslinger has always led itself to. Uh, so I feel like in a way this show will eventually morph into a not so plot driven heavy almost like anthology show with an overarching story but i don't think we're going to see it in every episode play out to a full on degree and there's nothing wrong with that that's that's how all shows used to be before breaking bad and game of thrones uh but that's all the vibe i'm getting here um i do have i've never had many criticisms for this show my first big one is in this episode and it's a personal preference but I don't buy Gina, is it Corrado? Um, her, Corrado. I don't buy her, her as a mercenary. Like, I feel like whenever she's delivering her dialogue, I just don't, she just doesn't come across as someone who's been through war, who's done all this stuff. She just, does, she just seems too almost clean cut and I, I just don't buy it. I think she's fine. And I, I think her character design is fucking badass. So whoever like credits to like the costume department for her character, she looks like she's like a great action figure. But I did, her performances didn't do it as much for me. Although I do like the the purpose of her character and the way that she was sort of playing around with um, our main protagonist. Um, sorry, I forgot the Mandalorian's name. Um, Mando. Like literally, Mando, he's, he's, right. on, he's on name right now. <laughs> it's such so, so fucking lazy. I love it. It's got the no, Mandalorian. I, 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 I love that he has no name. Mando. I love that he has no name, dude. And it's fucking yeah. awesome. Uh, uh, just but yeah, I, I do. Know, yeah, yeah. I do understand what you're saying. Like in terms of performances, maybe yeah, because you know we we haven't like fully got to know her yet. But I think the character was super fucking strong, dude. Like her character was really really well written. Like she she shows how experienced she is in battle so fucking well, man. Like, just the, like, you know, they have to get this ATST to step into the pond or the, or the fucking, you know, the riverbed or whatever so it can sink. And she just, you know, without hesitation, asks for the, the Mandalorian's gun and she just steps out there and just, you know, just takes, you know, t- takes it up upon her own shoulders, <laughs> yeah. dude. I love it. It's awesome. No, I agree. I think she's well written and well, like, Costume design's great. That's performance didn't really sell it as much, but it's a minor, it's a minor criticism. It wasn't so bad it took me out of the show or anything. Um, it's something that both this show, this episode and the last episode did as well is we had a lot of hand-to-hand combat, which we don't normally see in Star Wars, but I found interesting. But this this episode was still very fun. It was cool to see the whole like action sort of the whole the whole thing play out. I I do think the red eyes on the ATST, the ATAT, was a little ATST. cheesy. Get it yeah, right. ATST, sorry. Get it right. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I thought it was a little cheesy. It was a little edgy, but it's like it's Star Wars, so you let it slide. Wait, why was it um, cheesy? Just, just the black with the red. We've never seen the red eyes before. It hasn't been. It just, just the black with the red eyes. It's very like, oh look, it's a demon. 
like that. Yeah, I mean, but we we've only seen the ATSTs at, at, in daytime before. Like you know, like yeah, like there's look. I'm not saying it's bad. It just it's a little corny. It's been a little. It's a little you know, but that's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the special effects too. It's like there are some moments here where you're reminded it's a TV show, not a feature, but. Like that's still okay because fucking style. It's a free Star Wars mini movie Not every free. week. So, oh, sorry, it was like eight <laughs> bucks a month. Fucking great deal. I'm not <laughs> mad. I'm definitely not angry over it. But yeah, overall, uh, love both episodes. Still love the show. The Mandalorian is so fucking fun, and I just feel I'm, I feel like grateful that the show exists. Does that make sense? Is that no, weird it to does. say? It does, because, like, you know, you get that fix of Star Wars, you know what I mean? Like, when you, dude, if you watch this in, like, a, a home theater with surround sound, when that ATST is blasting its fucking bolts into the into the camp, it's fucking, ugh, it's, it's like you're mm. watching a film. Like, you know, it's awesome. Man, if you went back 10 years ago and showed this to people, they would lose their minds. It is insane. And as a giant Marvel fucking fanboy... Seeing this quality and knowing we got like what two hundred <laughs> Marvel TV I, shows. I coming. love that you say this every week. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's just like how good's the Loki? Show? How good is Falcon and Winter Soldier going to be? And One Division shit. If they're spending all this money on Star Wars, they're going to do the same for. Oh man! Speaking um, of which, we I'm, should be I'm getting a happy. Black Widow trailer soon. I'm pretty sure we we better fucking. It's mm, uh, it's it feels almost overdue. It yeah. feels almost overdue. Uh, I, I reckon, do you have anything else to, to mention about these episodes before we move on? No, man. Really, really keen um, for to see where it goes. Um, this is, I think, I think, kind of universally, this has been getting acclaimed, right? Like the Mandalorian. I haven't seen anyone who's been super fucking negative on it or, or down on it or anything like that. It seems like, it seems like, you know. As as much as you want to talk about fandom and and how the last Jedi kind of divi- like divided people, this is something that everyone can kind of agree on. Yeah, like I said it last episode, like the this shows clearly they made it for those hardcore fans that wanted a darker, more mature Star Wars. The movies are there to sell their toys, and like they're meant to be for more all ages. But this is for those those type of fans who like, especially the ones who loved Rogue One. And yeah, but you do, you know what, actually, I want to bring this up. I do find it interesting that there, you still see the seeds of Disney hidden throughout it. Like the very Disneyest moments. I'm talking like the amount of cute little characters like Baby Yoda that are there, you know, to sell toys or the the amount of new catchphrases they try and develop, which will just be great on t-shirts. Like already we've got, um, I have spoken and- this is the way. Like, you just know you're going to get pictures of those characters with these quotes on them and T-shirts and posters and all that shit. They're like, it, it just, it reminds me of like the whole merchandising aspect of it, which is not bad. Movies do this all the time. Uh, but just knowing it's Disney, you know, they had these talks and behind the scenes, they're like, all right, we need a catchphrase for someone so we can throw it on merch and stuff. I'm not a hater. I don't hate that, but I'd love really think about seeing that, that stuff, as well. To be honest. Oh, man, that's all I think about. <laughs> uh, let's move on. Let's do some reviews, shall we? Uh, what do you want to cover first? Let's talk 21 Bridges. Let's talk 21 Bridges. Automatic weapons, two shooters. They have training. How old were you when your father's captain came? I asked for you for a reason. I will find out. We just kill cops. We need to run. We got to move fast. Cars not ours. Plates are stolen. If we will catch these guys in the next three or four hours, they vanish. How are you going to do this? Close the island. Got 21 bridges in and out of Manhattan. Shut them down. Three rivers, close them. Four tunnels, block them. Stop every train and loop the subways. Then we flood the island with blow. 21 bridges starring Chadwick Boseman. What are your thoughts, bro? I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it off to you first, right? Because I think I think I'm gonna be the 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 downer for this one. You you hit me with your thoughts your thoughts first. Where do I start? Well, look, look, I've got to be honest. I went in really anticipating this movie. I've been anticipating it all year, knowing that the Russos were attached without a Marvel thing, seeing Chadwick Boseman in a lead role as a, like a new character. All these things just leap out to me. It seems really fun and exciting. And it's like not a massively budgeted sort of like detect. It's not, not massively budgeted, but it's like a detective sort of, 
sort of an action sort of ish type film like that's that's got me intrigued but i wanted to manage my expectations they still fell below my expectations i had a vibe going in i didn't see any reviews going in but i i did notice that the promotion the, the promotional material started like getting less and less close to the release date which made me think maybe they they weren't so hyped on it and i i can see why so all in all this is a pretty generic script it's a pretty generic sort of like i don't even know if detective is the right word maybe it's like a fugitive story trying to catch some fugitives everything that you expect will happen happens it's pretty it's pretty like paint by the numbers but everything around this generic script is actually pretty great so yeah generic scripts pretty wooden dialogue in points but there are some good actors that can make the wooden dialogue work most of the time definitely not all the time it's got a pretty good cast for the most part uh i think i i haven't seen a movie like this with such beautiful cinematography i think ever so i really like the cinematography Wait, for this type of ever? film Matt, um, like Matt, what, yeah. what sort of film like this? No, but for this type of film, ah, uh, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm gonna you know, probably, but I'm, I, I'm probably just gonna seen... say Heat, like right off the top. Uh, okay, I, I, I'll be honest, <laughs> I haven't seen Heat, so yeah. Whoa. Um, Whoa. I, I, but I'm a big, but I'm a Whoa. big fan of that type of aesthetic, that the neon sort of, uh, dark but pretty lights type thing. Like I don't know, all in all, I thought cinematography was pretty good. I, I think. I think I liked the... Oh, I'm struggling to think of more nice things to say. Look, overall, I had a fun time with the film. It was... I liked the pacing. I think that worked. It kept moving. It didn't really slow down for me. But the the script really let it down. I feel like everything around the script was great, but the script itself just really let it down. When it started off, I thought it started with a bang. Like, the shootouts were kind of brutal. I loved the sound sound design of it all and i was like oh fuck yeah this is gonna be great and then it was kind of downhill from there and then as it went on I'm like oh no oh well maybe they'll like bring it up and and nah uh so it was a pretty disappointing there were some like decent scenes around everything but ultimately i hate to say it, it's kind of forgettable but it's not a bad film i think i would give it a oh like a six or a seven, m- maybe like, let's say six and a half. Let's split it halfway through. But yeah, uh, ultimately though, a bit of a letdown. I wanted more, but I still had a good time. How about you? Yeah. Uh, 21 Bridges. What, um, what was this movie about again? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, well, there's think- 21 Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> there's 21 Bridges. It's set in New York. There's some fucking shooting in it. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there a little bit. Cause I, this movie is so forgettable. Um, it might be the most aggressively average movie I've seen in a very long time. <laughs> like it's it's just so average. Like you said, dude. Like the the script might be the worst offender here. The script lets down pretty much everything. Like the the production value is pretty good. Um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as saying that the cinematography is good. Like I, I wouldn't say that there's like some amazing shots in here. That's totally stand out it's more that it looks it, it's produced well like you know it's it's it, it's like it's produced better than you would expect a film like this to be produced as does that make sense somewhat um <laughs> <laughs> somewhat. Sorry. because like you know they, they're going for this like gritty sort of action thriller den of thieves sort of like vibe but yeah yeah it ends up looking a little too clean and clinical and a little too kind of like overproduced at points, you know? So mm. like that kind of works against it and it's, and it's like, you know, against it, you know, it, whatever. But uh, yeah, like I said, man, the script was just kind of super predictable. Like you kind of like know exactly where it's going. And then once you can like, once you can see where it's going, that's for me, that's where I switch off. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not really enjoying this anymore. Like, you know what I mean? I'll, there's gunfire, yay! There's a guy being, there's someone being held hostage, but then you know they miraculously end up escaping, yay! Um, and then you know the police are in on it, yay! And then it's gonna be the fucking chief, yay! Oh man, it's just <laughs> so run of the mill. Like it reminded me of, um, I brought this up to you afterwards. Um, directed by Richard Donner, who directed Superman, um, Sixteen Blocks. 
So 16 mm. Blocks is a movie starring Bruce Willis. It's about him um, escorting a witness, most deaf. <laughs> uh, 16 Block. 16 blocks across New York and basically there's these like, you know, corrupt uh, police officers who are trying to stop them. And they kind of reminded me of that, except that was done way, way better. Um, it was just, it was just so average. Like it, like, you know, Chadwick Boseman is giving it his all and you can see him trying very, very fucking hard, but it's just like, man, this is a, this is a brutal script. <laughs> like, you know, um, <laughs> some of the, you know, the, some of the action sequences are kind of decently done. Like I like, um, there's one sequence uh, when they're in an apartment and, like, you know, basically, you know, you've got these corrupt cops outside the door and, you know, they just start opening fire inside. Like, all of that's, you know, kind of well done because it's pretty tough to fuck up. You know, it's <laughs> it's it's tough to it's it's tough to ruin a scene where, you know, corrupt cops are just shooting inside a, an apartment building. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. This was a pretty fucking average movie for me. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't get a pass. It doesn't get a fail. Like I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't say rush out to the cinema and watch it right now. Um, maybe Netflix on a Sunday, um, Arvo when you're, you know, when it's raining outside and you have nothing else to do, uh, probably a five to be honest, man. This is, yeah, this is one of the most forgettable movies I've seen all year. So. Yeah. I think, um, uh, it's interesting. It's oh, okay. It's not interesting. It's not an interesting film, but it's not, I, it I really isn't. I, yeah, but I think it's it's not uh the, the script itself doesn't technically do anything wrong. It just does nothing new or makes no attempts to stand out and that's what brings it down. Like it's not it's not overly boring. Like it doesn't doesn't have it doesn't drag for for too much. It keeps the pace moving. It has enough plot twists and whatever and 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 like emotionally charged moments, See, but, but the plot it's twist, kind the of plot like it's just copy and paste of something else. Yeah, it yeah. is a copy and paste, and the plot twists aren't interesting when you can see them coming a mile away when they're signposted all over the fucking shop. You know what I mean? That's fair. I do think it is interesting the fact that you mentioned that a movie very similar to Twenty One Bridges is Sixteen Blocks <laughs> because. <laughs> It kind of feels like there's like a template going on, and well, I, was just, I was just doing some. I was just doing some googling. Um, there's actually some sequels coming out. There's there's 18 streets. <laughs> there's 43 <laughs> suburbs. Three there's 67 football fields. Yeah. Uh, there's 23 states. Nice. And 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 there's there's three local adult porn stores in my area. <laughs> hey, I'd watch that one. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I also feel like that they didn't really utilize this the the 21 Bridges premise as well as they could have. Like, That's a good point. Yeah. Although, although you know, the criminals, the, the two criminals are trapped in Manhattan, you never see them approach a bridge and be <laughs> like... <laughs> you know what I mean? right. you know, At the very least, the ending scene should have been a shootout on one of the bridges, right? right. Do you remember like... Do you, okay, you've, have you seen the movie The Town with Ben Affleck? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, okay. yeah, I have, yeah. So we covered that on the podcast, but like there's one... There's, there's, okay, so they, they rob an armored armored vehicle and like their one getaway from out of off the island is this one bridge and you know they have to get to they have to get over that bridge before the police shut it down like that is a great use of a bridge uh after a criminal activity (laughs) whereas this is just like this is just like let's shut this let's shut these bridges down i i do like how you know they close the 21 bridges and that gives them about like four hours to hunt these guys down because the FBI say that they have to reopen these bridges. But again, the FBI want to reopen these bridges so as not to affect, you know, New York City traffic. But my question is, like, you know, they do it at 1 a.m., right? Like, this is notoriously the city that never sleeps. <laughs> like, you know, he's, he's like, at one point, Chadwick Boseman's like, it's 1 a.m., not 1 p.m., so it should work. Like, it's just like, what? Come on, dude. Yeah. What are you telling me? Uh, and, and also to give you credit, something you mentioned to me off air, I remember when we watched it, you, you said something to the effect of, uh, what was it? <laughs> you said something like they, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. The whole concept of closing these bridges, it's the fucking Dark Knight. Like this is what <laughs> the Joker does. Like they no, just, they just like, they just saw, no, no, no. Oh, sorry, Dark Knight Rises. Rises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they were just like, oh, the hits, here's that scene. Yoink. It's a movie now. Yep. Yeah. It's like, okay, cool. Well, I think just before we wrap up to maybe the thing I was trying to say before about cinematography, maybe I'll just talk about the color palette. Right. Just a thought. 
Yeah, I, there's, there's a stark difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, I think we should move on to our next film of the review segment. Uh, which one do you reckon you want to take on next? Let's talk Knives Out. Ooh, Knives Out. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request that you all stay until the investigation is completed. What? Can we ask why? Has something changed? No. No, it hasn't changed, or no, we can't ask. Knives Out, directed by Ryan Johnson. Man, this one of my top ten, probably, of the year. I uh this thing blew me away, man. I <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Um Probably the writing. I am very, very jealous of Ryan Johnson's script writing abilities. This this is so man, to to give all of these characters such great personalities and then taking their individual individual personalities and kind of like putting in this giant sort of melting pot and see how each one kind of reacts to the other family member, that that to me is the true piece of entertainment here. Like you know, we we have we have this guy Harlan who is you know the the patriarch of the family, and he's the one who's been murdered. Uh, by the way, guys, spoilers, massive spoilers, right? <laughs> like this is this is a, this is a movie that you don't want spoiled for you before you go in. Um, but yeah, essentially, it, it takes the, the you know the 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 famous clue sort of like um, I guess structure, uh, you know, like who who done it sort of thing, right? And you know, murder on the Orient Express, Agatha Christie. Um, it's funny actually because I think Ryan Johnson or maybe it might have been Daniel Craig, but like Agatha Christie's like most famous character is Hercule Poirot, who um was the lead of Murder on the Orient Express and you know, he's got his pretty stark, you know, British accent. So Ryan Johnson's like, I'm gonna create my own Hercule Poirot detective and give him like the most American accent ever. <laughs> it's Daniel Craig <laughs> with the KFC yeah. accent. <laughs> um yeah, man, I, I just I just had so much fucking fun with this movie. I had no idea where it was going. Um, I think the I think the ace up this movie's sleeve is using um, Anna Diamas's character as the lead, uh, who is Marta. She plays Marta. Um, I think seeing all the events from her perspective and her point of view might be the best way to kind of put like put this film. Um, because you know she is kind of like the one innocent, and she's also not part of the family either she's um as the movie kind of progresses you know she's the the nurse essentially she's the the bystander and she's the reason sorry she's the one who you know harlan ends up giving his stuff to um much to the chagrin of the family right like jesus christ that scene with the will reading holy shit like you know it's gonna go to Marta, yeah. but like the entertainment is seeing everyone's reaction like michael shannon oh. immediately is like no <laughs> just, just like Dude, no. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis owns that scene. Oh my She's god! She's like, "You bitch!" And she just starts going all out. Her <sighs> fingers in her face. I laughed my freaking balls off. Man. So, so, so good, dude. And like, you know, the, the comedy is so well placed as well, man. Like, I, I love the running joke, um, of like the the family members don't exactly know where Marta is from. Like every time they talk about her, it's like, oh yeah, she's from Jamaica or she's from Ecuador. <laughs> like, you know, like just a little shit like that. Um, Chris Evans is fucking great in this movie, dude. Like, yeah. <laughs> like you, yeah, I mean, he is the the mastermind. It's revealed at the end of this movie. Um, and and his his motivations they're not that hard to understand, right? Like he's yeah. kind of like this. He's kind of this rich kid who's been, you know, he's kind of got all like everything that he's ever wanted all his life. Like that's basically this entire family. Like, you know, as the movie progresses, you you see like sequences of Harlan cutting the family off, and one of them is Chris Evans, and oh, it's just it's just such a tight script, dude. It's such a tight script with such great acting and great comedy and great cinematography and great music and great. Um, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I, I, this, this movie stuck with me, and I actually cannot wait to go see it again. I really do want to go see it again. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. You go, you go, dude. I love this fucking movie. So I, I really like this movie, but I definitely didn't enjoy it as much as you. Um, scared. I just imagine you were just like crunk, crunk like 
clenching your fist hard. You're oh, probably mad at me for saying that. It, it, uh, I understand <laughs> it. I understand it for this movie, but if you tell me you hate the next movie, then I'm fucking done. <laughs> no, no, I like the next movie. I like the next one. Uh, but this one I do really, really like. Uh, there's a few small things I just can't get over, though. The, the biggest one, and it's personal taste, but I hate, hate, hate the Southern drawl accent that Daniel Craig is doing. Maybe it's because it's so against the type for him, but I couldn't get it out of my head about how that it was fake. And maybe just because I'm not used to seeing it on camera and maybe because I'm used to seeing him do like an English accent, but like I just didn't buy it. And I found that very distracting for me. But I think that's meant to be the kind of the point. Like, yeah, you're not- it's pretty over the top. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't think it's fully fair to criticize it, especially when they call it out. Like, there's a line by Chris Evans in the film where he sort of calls it out. He's like, I'm so sick, you're so then drawl. And he, and he starts that's why, doing the voice too. Yeah, that's like, why, so, that's why I, I, led with the, I, I led with my thoughts about the, the Poirot comment. Yeah, so I, I, think it's, I think it's like, at least they acknowledge it, but I found that a little bit distracting. Uh, my, my, you know, let's start with some of the positives as well, like, the cinematography is fucking beautiful. Like, it's not just that, actually. It's that. It's the color choice. It's the production design. It's the character design. Everything about this film is beautiful. Like, there's not an ugly shot in the whole film. It is freaking beautiful to look at. Um, And Ryan Johnson has done a tremendous job in establishing the characters very well. It's funny because just recently we saw Ready or Not, which sort of had a semi-similar approach in terms of having a rich family in a rich house with each character with their own distinct personalities and that makes them all clash and they actually some of them fall into similar archetypes as this obviously different genres of film but it's just funny to sort of see the the similarities good there good pickup yeah like it's it just it's just funny how they just released around similar time but that was the strongest thing about ready or not and it's probably the strongest thing about knives out as well um on that point as well like the comedy it's this is this is i found a little bit interesting because the it was sold as a full-on sort of straight up comedy i felt like the trailer was really funny but i felt the jokes were kind of spaced out in this now it's kind of worth it because when the jokes land they land fucking hard it is genuinely i mean generally a really hilarious like moments and it's not like coming derived from like just the performances, it's the writing as well. So I think you really got to commend how great some of the jokes, the, the 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 gag at the end where the fake the knife stabs her, it turns out it's fake. The reveal of that is pretty funny. The uh, my my favorite one is Jamie Lee Curtis when she fucking like calls calls uh calls her a bitch when they in the will scene like that. Oh dude. Oh man, my, I, my I was thing- dying. <laughs> My thing was, um, like, you know, when she tells a lie at the end and she's like, she vomits just suddenly and it's like, oh, fuck, no way. <laughs> yeah. Right so in his good. face, like, fuck. So good. Like, it, was, it was really well done. And the, and the both the cast, dude, this cast is insane. Insane. And, I, and I'm glad that they had the character, the meat for the characters to back up this cast. It's very rare to see that done so well. I think movies like, Terminator Dark Fate can learn a fuck ton from a script like this because that was a that was a film for example that had look at all these really like strong like these I don't know cool characters and they all do fucking nothing but in this everybody kind of has something I do wish and as personal preference but I wish I saw a little bit more Jamie Lee Curtis just because I thought she was so cool in it but you know you can't have them all uh, my 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 big problems though is I felt like. This might be personal preference, but like the first act I thought thought was a bit slow. It took me a while to be like, where is this going? It took a while for it to pick up for me, especially since I feel like there weren't a lot of heavy jokes in the beginning. Like I feel like the movie got funnier as it went. Well, I don't. Um, what, uh, so you were, that's interesting, actually. You were expecting an all out comedy. I, I, I went in expecting like a full on mystery. Ah, interesting. I know. Just when I see bright colors like that. And I felt the 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 trailer was kind of comedically cut. I was expecting it to be. I didn't think it to be like a full on all out comedy. I knew it was still the mystery thing was like meant to be like the main draw. Yeah, but that's the. I expected front and a lot yeah. more jokes, especially in the first half. Like I feel like most of the funny moments were like in the second half of the film. Um, but I, I, 
I'm really glad they didn't overdo it with the comedy. Actually, I think we're both on two opposite spectrums here. <laughs> like, Ooh, yeah, yeah, it I, sounds like it. Yeah. I actually really like that they didn't take it in a massively comedic direction, only because I think the comedy kind of undercuts the seriousness of the murder, if that makes sense. And like, mm. what's at the heart of this is is the murder. Like, it, it, you know, if you if you undercut the seriousness of the murder, then why are we even looking for someone? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it kind of like hold. Yeah. Hold that thought because I'm going to come into that my next point. But I just want to also say here, just I feel like because the opening sort of half hour and stuff, a lot of it is just people being interviewed one by one. And I understand why they're going to do that because they have to set up everything. But I feel like that part of it was just so slow. And I also think not having Chris Evans featured in much in the first half hour Maybe maybe it's just me because to me he's like the biggest draw of the film. Uh, not seeing him for that, it kind of made me go, oh, where the fuck is he type thing. But that's probably also intentional. So it's not fully fair to criticize it for that. But moving into the element about the murder. So this is like the big thing they sell us on. It's a whodunit film. Whodunit film. But in, in the middle section of the film, they reveal who did it. Uh, and it's just like the main character. Sorry, I forgot her name. What was it? Carl? Carl? Marta. Carl? Carl, Carl what? Wait, are you talking oh, about the main, the main, the main character? It's, yeah. Her name What's is her name? Marta. Oh, Marta. Sorry, my bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they reveal that, and so from then on, I'm kind of like, where is this going? I feel like the plot wasn't right. It was, it was funnily enough, as from around that point, the movie got more interesting. But I was just kind of like, what are we still doing here if we know who it, that she killed him? Uh, even though you assume there's more to. There's more to be revealed. Yeah, uh, like I, I get that. I, you know what? When you said, when you said, hold that thought, and we'll talk about the murder. I thought that's what you'd bring up because, like, um, it's it's a suicide technically. Uh, it is a suicide, mm. but what what happens is, you know, she overdoses him with morphine, right? Um, but like, yeah, you, you are right. You do find that out probably even towards the end of the first act, right? Like, if anything. Uh, probably not yeah. even halfway, like right before that. So I, I really wasn't expecting, you know, because like when you watch movies like Murder on the Orient Express or even Clue, like you're waiting for that reveal to happen at the end. And I like that it played with our, with our expectations. Yeah. Like I like that it was kind of like, you know, let's reveal this here, but- Obviously, this is a two-hour film that you're watching, and there's there's going to be way more to this, right? Yeah, and the there way, has to be a climax. Absolutely, and the way that Marta Marta is acting, like you you know that she's innocent, right? But then you've also kind of like got this idea at the back of your head of like, well, maybe she's being, you know, maybe she's being deceptive. Like maybe there's being maybe there's a bit more to this story. Um, but yeah, I, I do, my, I, yeah. No, go on. I was thinking. I was thinking. I kept thinking to myself. If they start to reveal that she did it on purpose or something and she was evil, I'm fucking going to be mad because it, they, they, that means they're lying to us or, or something. So I'm glad <laughs> like they didn't Kaiser go that Soze route. kind of situation. Yeah. Or some shit like that, you know? Like, that would have been whack. I think the twist and the way they revealed it, though, was fucking awesome, though. Uh, they, they did a freaking great job. The, the movies like this, they sort of rely on that climactic big twist thing. And this movie pulls it off like crazy. I do think it's incredibly unrealistic how fast this guy figures stuff out. Like he saw a toxicology report that said that she was in good health and he pieces every single step together, which is like a 20 minute reveal. So, or at least 15 minute reveal. So it's a little unrealistic, but it's the movies. You let it slide, I guess. But I, know, I think if you have characters like Sherlock Holmes and Hercule Poirot, you can let that go. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, like it's yeah, a- but he's not. He's not that good of a like they say he is, but throughout the whole film, like like they even make a point like he's not a very good detective. Like she said that to him, she's not a good murderer. Like I just didn't get that. But I don't know. Um, I, I think like because they the way he structures his investigation, right? Like he he brings Marta on as kind of like a human lie detector. And that yeah. is such a smart fucking move. Like you know what I mean. Like if I was a if I was a detective, and you have this person who is susceptible to vomiting, if 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 she tells a lie, then I'm just like, hey, do not leave my side. You know what I mean. Don't don't leave, yeah. don't leave my side while I do this investigation because that's what I'm gonna do. I think I think what was happening is throughout the entire movie, he's piecing these things together, and it's not until that last little 
piece of the puzzle with the toxicology report, that's when he's like, okay, the final piece of the puzzle has fallen in for me. That's, I mean, it, it wasn't really that big of a stretch for me because I don't, th- I definitely don't think he came up with that in the last twenty minutes. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe that's maybe that's so. Uh, but yeah, overall, I think what really sells this film is the the chemistry, the character, the performances. Really awesome. I'd give this, I think, an eight, and I think that's that's a fair review. No, that is. Um, yeah, I'm I'm yeah, gonna go high. But, I'm gonna go nine. So yeah, I do want to bring up something and just talk about it because I think this also appear. Uh, this also applies to Twenty One Bridges. Uh, that, there I go again, comparing movies that have nothing <laughs> in common. Uh, but okay, so I remember a long time ago, I was watching a comedian on YouTube. I can't remember who it is, and they were talking about Law and Order. And they 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 mentioned they mentioned the way to know how a Law and Order episode ends is you watch the opening credits because whoever it says guest starring someone that's always going to be the killer because they're going to get the big actor they've got to give him the best scenes so it's always going to be the big name so based on that alone in both in this we should have known it was Chris Evans and in Twenty One Bridges we should have known it was uh what's his name with Flash guy uh um. What's his name? J. Jonah Jameson? Put on oh, Bridges. Um, J.K. Simmons? J.K. Simmons. Like, we should have known it was J.K. Simmons, and we should have known it was Chris Evans based on the billing alone. Because I'll I don't, throw I don't. out all the all these red herrings and stuff, but it always is. You watch, next time you go have some detective movie stuff, just try and figure out who the biggest actor is, unless, for the exception of, like, maybe the main character. And that suspect, boom, they're the killer in the end. That's always a twist. It's Because they're not going to give them just one small scene. I think- You know? I th- I think I, I I definitely agree with you with the Twenty One Bridges one, but I, I'm gonna have to stand up for Knives Out, dude. Like I I know I know I'm beating a drum here, but it's like we- okay, Chris Evans is big because of Avengers and Captain America, obviously fucking Marvel, right? But I mean, they gave enough. Like Michael Shannon is massive right now, and so is Jamie Lee Curtis. Like Jamie Lee Curtis is making a like apparently a comeback, like right, you know, with fucking Halloween. No, nah, she is, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, and not only that, but they've done so much sort of like heavy lifting in terms of the motivation setup. So I, yeah, I, I definitely didn't predict. Did you see that coming with Chris Evans? No, I definitely didn't. But what I'm saying is I should have based on that. And yeah. I'm willing to bet next time you go to a movie, and this is my theory, next time you go to a movie and you got to predict who the killer is, it's the biggest actor who's like in a supporting role. But yeah, yeah. okay. That, that's my little <laughs> that's my little thing. Sorry, I just, I just wanted to throw that in. No, Anyways, no. let's close this off. Uh, so sorry, I was I was eight, you were nine, and then finally we've got Martin Scorsese's The Motherfucking Irishman. Hi, you Frank. Would you like to be a part of history? Yes, I would. Big business and the government are working together, trying to pull us apart. Something's got to be done. What else you say? Now is not the time to not say. We're going at war with these people. War. Things have gotten out of hand with our friend. You gotta sit down. Everybody says so. No, I'm not sitting down. I can't do it. It's what it is. What it is. I know things. They don't know I know. gonna happen either way he's going so i have you seen this what twice three times i, I have seen this twice yeah twice that's six hours of your life si- no, it's like seven hours of your life seven uh i expect a really in-depth analysis man man because <laughs> you, you you would have seen every freaking pixel of this shit lay it on me yeah Going up the irishman I think you will get an in-depth analysis because I've been doing a little bit of research too behind this one. So bear with me oh, here. Oh, God. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I definitely, I saw this in the cinema first. Uh, I saw I actually saw this about two to three weeks back um, and you you hadn't seen it and I definitely wanted to have a discussion with you about it. So that's why we kind of held off on the review. Um, saw it at Dendi in the cinema, three and a half hours, one sitting. I think Jose uh, put in the after party because I put in a, I put in a little um, like someone kind of broke down the movie and like you know how you could watch it as basically a mini series in like four parts, 
and like they put the timestamps and stuff because it is long. It's a three and a half hour movie. Like that is massive, right? Um, you know, you got fucking audiences these days with short of attention spans and all that, whatever, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, I saw it, Dendi, uh, opening night and man, I goddamn love this movie. Goddamn loved this movie, man. Like it was, it was just such an experience. Um, and I, I loved it that first time around and it wasn't until the second viewing on Netflix that I was like, okay, I think this this might be my favorite film of the year. I know. That's a big fucking call, right? Like it's I mean, if you're if you're saying already that, you know, you have a favorite movie of the year, then it's like what the fuck. Um, but I've I've had a long hard think about it, dude. I I I I cannot stop thinking about this movie. This is such a fantastically told story. Um and it and my favorite part is, you know, Although the three and a half hour runtime is going to be scaring, is going to scare some people off. That to me is one of its strongest points. I love that this is a movie that absolutely takes its time. Um, you know me, man. I like my slow burns. Like that's something that I'm kind of into. Um, but not only that, I think this like the 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 slow burn of this story is warranted because this is a story about an old man who is recounting his regret about killing his best friend you know what i mean like he's he's talking about like man like i i basically without saying this he's like i regret killing my best friend um these are the circumstances this is the way it has to be it is what it is is what (laughs) is what buffalino says at one point um and it's kind of like this really really tragic even shakespearean slash greek fucking tragedy um that's just so hauntingly told like you know Here's one aspect of this, right? So, like, when you know, when when you meet new characters, and you know, it fucking freeze frames, and then you know, Scorsese puts the, uh, here's this guy, he was shot in the head in 1971, blah blah. Yes, that is comedic at first, but then it's kind of like it's kind of haunting. It's fucking. It's like if you're in this life, you are doomed. Like, you know what I mean? And if you if you know even a little bit about the story of Jimmy Hoffa, then you know that this is this is a story that's going to end in sadness. Um, I, I I love that you know he puts like right at the start he's like you know <laughs> kids these days they don't even know who Jimmy Hoffa was. Um, I'm going to be a hundred percent honest. I didn't know until like a month before. Um, I didn't start looking into it or anything like that until a month before. I definitely heard the name. A hundred percent, I definitely heard the name in movies and shit before, but I'd never really looked into it. This was a dude that was declared in real life missing for 44 years before he was announced dead. Like, 44 years. Um, he he is still currently... No one knows who killed him, a hundred percent. Although this movie does posit that Frank Sheeran, so Robert De Niro's character, killed him uh, and the mafia killed him, that's not a hundred percent official like that's not the official story so this let me lay down some fucking facts on you right like this is my <laughs> this is this is my digging my researching uh this movie is based uh on a book called i heard you paint houses um uh, that book uh i heard you paint houses is uh written by a guy named charles brandt um charles brandt is an investigative journalist and basically he put together this book and basically that book recounts frank sheeran's sort of like tale uh frank sheeran is on record as confessing to the murder of um of um fucking jimmy hoffa uh but again there's no physical evidence to really tie him to that the fbi had a list um that kind of put a bunch of people on that you know possibility where it's like they, they they could have killed Jimmy Hoffa but again no one has really been charged for it um it was it- Wait, so I'm confused is this a true story or is this a fictional story based on true stuff no so it's okay so let's 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 use an example right let's is, use is this like once upon a time in hollywood that's what i was just like about that? to say so let's use right. once upon a time in Ho- as Ho- sorry once upon a time in hollywood and put it up against this. So this is more of a true story than Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because we know for a fact that Sharon Tate was murdered that night, right? We know we know that for a fact, and we know um, we know that the way that movie ends. Uh, spoilers for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, guys. I don't really like talking spoilers about other movies during the review, so but this is what's going to happen. Um, 
the way that movie ends is kind of like Tarantino's sort of like fairy tale ending or like or kind of like if only sort of situation. Whereas this is more like um, Frank Sheeran. Frank Sheeran confessed, and this is the way it went down according to his confession. Like that's 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 true. That's on the record. He confessed to the murder. Although again, no physical evidence. It's just his confession. Um, there is evidence of him being best friends with Jimmy Hoffa. There is evidence of him, you know, running a uh, a Teamsters union local. Um, there's definitely there's definitely quite a lot of you know he he definitely murdered people. Like let's put it that way. Like Frank Sheeran murdered people for the mafia. Um, it's funny actually. I was reading a an interview. Um, unfortunately, I'm forgetting the cinematographer's name, but he, he was a cinematographer, and he's like, the way that Martin Scorsese and I decided to shoot this movie, we wanted it to shoot to shoot it like nothing like Martin Scorsese has done before. So when I kind of went into this movie, I was expecting something like Goodfellas or like Casino. Like, you know, whenever you get like murders in those movies, it's kind of like, um, you know, like really if you if you get like a death scene, there's like, you know, loud music that plays and it's like really like old school music and it's just like, check out this fucking anarchy. Whereas in this, it's like the, the word that the cinematographer uses is workmanlike. Um, they wanted to show that this Frank Sheeran guy, he he was a blue collar kind of like workman guy. Like he was not anything fancy. Like he just literally went up to you, shot you a couple times in the head, walked off. And that's that's literally what he did. Um, yeah, man. I, I, I know I've ranted on about this movie for fucking ever now, but um, this is three and a half hours of just pure. I'm I am in this movie from start to finish. Like I love the the whole idea of the the Cosa Nostra, who is the you know the the Buffalino, the 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 family that he's a part of. I love how they. Um, how they directly affect what's happening in Cuba. I love the, you know, the connection to JFK. Um, I, man, I think if there is an MVP of this movie, it's fucking Al Pacino. Man, is Al Pacino an absolute powerhouse in this movie. And can you believe that Al Pacino has never, ever worked with Martin Scorsese before this? Like, don't they just seem That's like- crazy. A, they seem like a match made in heaven, dude. <laughs> um, it, it, it seems like an obvious pairing. Right. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, but I, don't, I also don't want to talk shit about Pesci as well, man. Pesci, Pesci just killed it. Like this is this he he was retired for this movie. Like they bought him out of retirement. Like you know what I mean. Um, and he just mm. like they talk about him in like the because on Netflix there's like a kind of like a little documentary that shows you the making of, and they talk about like how. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it's. Fuck yeah! Quite, I can't, I'm gonna watch that. Absolutely, yeah. get on it for sure. Um, and they talk about like how Pesci, this is not the type of character that you'd expect him to play. Like Buffalino, Russell Buffalino is kind of like a, he's subdued, he's quiet, um, but he's at the same time, he's fucking scary. Like, you know what I mean? Mm. Like when he's yeah. telling Frank Shear and Robert De Niro's character that, um, that Jimmy Hoffa has to go, he's like, it is what it is. You know, like we've, we've done all we can for him. Like that shit scares the fuck out of me like you know just the whole <laughs> just the whole like you know this is this is done we've we've done all we can you know he's he's losing us money um and then you know he he takes him he drives him to the plane oh it's just i love it all i love it all man like this is absolutely one of my favorite movies of all time now I, it's definitely up there now um i absolutely i turned it off and my dad turns it to me and he's like i I think that might be one of the best movies I've ever seen. Um, and not only that, man, like, and I promise this is probably one of, one of my last points. <laughs> one of. <laughs> um, I love that you get to see these gangsters grow old and die eventually. Like, I love, you never see the whole aftermath of of this kind of life. You know what I mean? You never see the whole, you, you never see how the survivors kind of, end up like you know they're in prison and then you know they're 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 pushed aside by their family by their daughter they're resented you know i mean at the end frank sheeran's literally buying his own coffin and he's like i just want i I want this to be over with um and that to me is just that it doesn't that doesn't become a more tragic story than that man like it's just yeah this is it's it's insane to believe that martin scorsese is 76 years of age and he's still making something like this um i 
I put this up there with George Miller making uh, Fury Road at the age that he was. Um, I I have, yeah. I don't know, man. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like I said, if this doesn't get a 10, then I don't know what does. So it's an absolute 10 for me. Fuck yeah. Uh, like, Follow that, bitch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely can't. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not even going to attempt. Um, look, I think, I think you were sort of closing in on a point that uh, I think it's worth mentioning. It is cool that this film at the end, like it does show you all throughout about him getting older. It's about him regretting what he did. And I kind of like the way and the, the more realistic attempt of showing kind of what the opposite of what gangster movies do. Like it doesn't glorify at all. It, it works almost like a really, the way a good biopic does in a way, even though it's sort of technically not it's a biopic. It's very matter of fact, it's right? Like, it's it's yeah it's it's like real life fiction, but I I like that approach to the storytelling and, the, and the, like what it has to say. Like this movie has something to say, and I feel like uh, we need more films doing doing that. Like they're, they're often the best films too. Uh, you also talked about the the length, and I feel like this is a great example of a film justifying its runtime. Most films that go for three hours don't fucking need to be three hours. Uh, I still look at Endgame and go, bitch, you could have done that in two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, and it's not like they were they were dragging out for more cool epic action scenes. No, but this film, it justifies it. I feel like everything matters or it adds an extra layer to it all. It does a great way of building character. The way it uses the non-linear time um, structure really works for it. Um, normally I would criticize a film like this into a point where it's kind of like, there isn't so, uh, you know what? No, no. What I normally say is, oh, there's not really much of a obstacle goal that he's working towards other than the fact that there's one storyline about him trying to build up his career while the other's about him trying to travel somewhere. But that's not a problem for me because, uh, you, you, you care about the characters. They do a really good job making you give a shit. Like they they really take the gangsterness out of being a gangster in this right. in a way. If if like, the relationship like, between Jimmy Hoffa and Frank Sheeran doesn't work, then the movie doesn't work. Hundred percent, and they fucking really work. The 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 dyna- dynamics of all the characters are really interesting. Uh, it's 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 done really well. But the thing that really stuck with me is from the very very beginning. I'm talking the first 10, 20 seconds. It just made me think about all the whole um. Scorsese saying Marvel's not cinema. Uh, uh, uh. I'm watching it, and like the first 20 seconds, I'm just like, "Oh fuck, this is cinema!" Like <laughs> it feels, it feels prestigious, like a prestigious, Oscar-y fucking cinematic work of Genius. art. It feels yeah. artistic. The whole thing feels like artistic, and and I don't usually suck a suck a directorial dick this often that wrinkly 76 <laughs> but, year old dick yeah oh but it's it's a you know it's, it's a that dick is a paintbrush and that it's painting a masterpiece wow that's a that's a quote <laughs> <laughs> dick is a paintbrush and it's painting a masterpiece <laughs> last episode it was always, always a bigger dick why do we all have so many dick quotes man anyway we're obsessed with penises um, and we're totally yeah, straight we, men we, we, we're, we're like that we're like uh, Jonah Hill in Superbad. We we got a problem, <laughs> but yeah, I really, I really do. Uh, like immediately, it sucks you in, and it feels like this is pe- these are these are professionals in their. It feels like they're in their prime. It's crazy to think so many old people are in this film, and it feels like they're in their prime, which is insane. Like just thinking about it is pretty incredible. I think one thing that's worth talking about. I'm surprised you didn't touch on this the because, uh, yeah, the CGI. Yeah, um, it, we can talk it, about it. Look, look, it looks really good. Uh, that's the main thing, and the fact that they age them up in some scenes and de-age them in others. There's not like I feel like this is the best we've seen it. Like we've seen, we've seen Gemini Man do it fucking terribly. We've seen Rogue One do it like sort of like uncanny uncanny valley ish where like they've got something going on but i haven't mastered it M- captain marvel did a really good I think job that might be my um, favorite still like yeah the captain marvel yeah. with samuel L. jackson for sure because black don't yeah, cry that- really right yeah right but um in this movie like there's not a single shot where i'm like oh that doesn't look right in fact yeah. i i gotta be honest with you 
throughout it, I started forgetting how old yes. Robert De Niro is. 100%. And in some parts, I'm like, have they aged him up here? Or is that how he actually is? Oh, wait, is this him normal or is this him de-aged? Like, I was having trouble figuring him out. On that point, it is worth mentioning, it does feel a little weird when he's younger, where he still kind of looks like he's probably in his thir- thirty, late 30s, early 40s, and that he's getting called kid. And I'm like, I'm looking at it going, maybe he's meant to be younger than he is here, <laughs> but I'm not too sure. But that's 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 so minor. It doesn't so, matter because the face looks so good. I, I don't want to lie. Like the first time I saw him, um, like when they're, when they're fixing the truck together, like that that was kind of jarring to me a little bit. Like it's like, oh, okay, so maybe, you know, it's, it's looking a little weird here. But like as the movie goes on, it's just like you, you're totally kind of like, get nestled like right into it dude and you totally forget because what's happening on screen is just so fucking compelling and then you're just like I, I, i'm watching pixels here on screen you know you totally forget mm. that shit yeah i, I don't know like I, it, there was never a moment for me where i was like oh they, like i think first time i saw it oh this is where they've done it but i never thought it never looks bad at all which is really impressive i do think we're starting to overuse this technology now we're starting to use it for the sake of it sometimes but um, I love the fact that it's getting better and better. And this is probably maybe the best we've seen it. Uh, or maybe Captain Marvel. It's one or the other. Um, what else is there worth talking about? Look, there's not dialogue. really much I've left to say. Dialogue. Uh, dialogue? What? It's fucking great. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't talk enough about the dialogue, dude. Like, there are some scenes in here that feel... And to me, I think Tarantino is still the dialogue king. But there are scenes in here that feel Tarantino-esque. Like, the scene where... You know they're in Florida, and he meets. Uh, sorry, it's it's um <laughs> it's Frank Sheeran and Jimmy Hoffa meeting with uh, Tony Pro, and this is after their kind of like incident at the at the prison, and you know it's like oh you're ten minutes late, and Tony Pro is like yeah this is traffic, and then he's like uh, <laughs> he's like maybe maybe fifteen, and he's like you have to account for traffic. And he's like, that's what I'm accounting for. I'm accounting for 10 minutes of traffic. <laughs> and it's just like, you never want this, like you never want it to end. You just want to keep watching these fucking assholes, like go back and forth about this shit. You know, like it's just so, so good. So good. Yeah. Uh, man, well, sorry. Mike. Just one more thing as well about the dialogue. Uh, I'm really sorry to keep cutting you off, Matt. <laughs> You're right. Um, my favorite scene in this entire movie is the scene where, um, they're at the awards sort of like presentation where Frank's getting honored. And this is after the conversation that Frank has with Jimmy Buffalino and basically, sorry, Jimmy, um, sorry, Russell. And Russell says, you know, it is what it is. You know, we, we're going to have to get rid of him. And Frank goes to talk to Jimmy Hoffa and basically it's this really long protracted sequence. And it's like, it's it's Frank being like, it is what it is, man. Like, you know, they've got the word. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to shut this shit down. Whatever you're doing. And like, it's it's Jimmy Hoffa. It's a great fucking performance by uh, Al Pacino. And he's like, he's like, this is, you know, this is, this is my union. This is, this is who I am. Like, you know, and it's just yeah. like this really long protracted sequence of this like friend, like telling him you're going to have to do this or you're just going to, like, they're going to pull the trigger on you. Who do you think has a better chance at an Oscar? Out of um, Joe Pesci, De Niro, and Al Pacino, I think it'll be Al Pacino for sure. Um, yeah. If he if he doesn't win, because it's it's a very strong year, not in just in terms of movies, but in terms of actors as well. Um, yeah, it's it's very strong. So I think I, I think Al Pacino's definitely got a shot. I don't. I mean, as much as I love Pac- uh, sorry Pesci in this movie, I don't think there's enough of him to kind of really make a full-on impression at the Oscars. And I don't think... I mean, look, man, this is such a... It's so good to see De Niro back on form. Like, you know what I mean? Like, after so right. long, it's so good to see him back on form. And, like, I'm not I even kidding. I haven't seen him do this well in, like, what feels like a thousand years. A hundred percent. And, like, you know, his scene... His roles, his role in the in Joker wasn't substantial enough, I think. But yeah, um, he made me cry in this movie. Like, I'm not even going to say, like, I, I'm not even ashamed to admit it. Like, the scene where um, he's at the bank, he's in you the line. You fucking pussy. <laughs> he's in you line. You know me, man. I don't cry about <laughs> shit, man. I'm a hard-ass thug. I don't give a fuck. No, there's, just, there's just something to me about, like, an old man recounting his life uh, and, and, you know, going through his regrets and being like, well, if only I had done this, if only I had done that. 
and like him in line at the bank, you know, waiting to see his daughter and his daughter puts up the, you know, tell her clothes kind of thing. And like him just being, him just like being like Peggy. And then like, you know, she walks off and I was like, God damn, the, you've got me here. You've got me here. Um, but yeah, I think, I think if, if anyone, it'll be Pesci for sure. Yeah. Probably, this is probably going right. to win for adapted screenplay as well. Oh, bro. Like, I don't know if there's much competition there. Right. Let's be if, real. If like, not directing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also want to, like, you mentioned Tarantino earlier uh, before you rudely interrupted me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk. Uh, but yeah, I think this does feel almost at times Tarantino esque. Uh, but what I love is that it looks like a Scorsese film. Like, I know that he's uh, supposedly changed a few things around, but I feel like his films do have some sort of like, it's kind of clean, but it's also kind of like, it's like you're looking into the past through rose tinted glasses, if that makes sense. I always feel that with a, from a bunch of his films, like Great Gatsby comes to mind as well. Uh, and I just love that aesthetic. Like, I can't explain it, but like, when I look at a few frames, I can tell it's a Scorsese film a lot of the time. Not always, but a lot of the time. And I feel like this, I, I just love that vibe that this movie does. It really captures it well. Uh, I don't know if anything else left, left to say other than uh, I thought it was really good. I thought it was really good. I give this a 9 out of 10. Nice. I just remember the criticism I had for Knives Out. I had too much ADR and the editing wasn't as great, but it was still pretty good. But uh, you guys didn't know that. Irishman's fucking incredible. I like Knives Out. 21 Jump Street. Uh, 21 Jump Street. 21 Bridges. <laughs> it's incredibly Jump average. <laughs> Dude, I love that crossover. 21 Jump Bridges. Jump Street Bridges. I'm good. I'd love to see that. Make it. Make it. Make it, Sony. Uh, I just I really, you- really want to watch The Irishman again. <laughs> You know what I want to watch? Speaking of 21 Jump Street, remember how during the Sony the, leak they yeah, talked about the doing a Jump Street Men, Men in Black, Black crossover? Yeah. How much better would have that been, have been than Men in Black International? So much better. Oh, I, I can't remember any oh. anything about International. So, uh, Did you remember that it's fucking terrible? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think that wraps up uh, today's episode of Midnight Double Feature. Um, make sure you like, comment, subscribe whatever they the cool kids do these days uh do all that shit on our find us on facebook instagram whatever give us five stars on itunes or you can go suck your own dick i'll give you that choice one or the other (laughs) and yeah um make sure you check out our latest episode um which uh guest stars one of the crew from lsg media really enjoy it when they come over we we love those guys um anything else we gotta we gotta plug or mention before we head off no, that's pretty much it, man. Um, we haven't we haven't announced our next next episode of uh, feature presentations, but um, we it's it's recorded, it's done. We did two back to back, so um, only because you know December is such an incredibly busy month for everyone involved. Um, yeah. So should we should we tell them that? What do you reckon? Sure, sure. So our next feature presentation episode is Men in Black. <laughs> speaking of men in black international i know <laughs> that's why like it full-on reminded me i was like oh wait we're talking about men in black now maybe i should just drop it here but yeah men yeah. in black is the next episode um really really keen to let you guys hear that one that was a great episode that colin and i did over the weekend um yeah uh spoiler alert love that fucking movie dude fuck yeah it's great it's probably will smith's one of his best performances easy i think um, also, I think we should, we should also mention that uh, this is more for your benefit than I guess the listeners, but last year we did not one but two episodes recapping every movie we reviewed in the year. I think it's about time that we do ours very soon, probably getting when it's getting close to New Year's or something, but so maybe next episode or the one after that uh, in the near future, we definitely need to do a recap of 2019 because we've seen a lot of movies this year. Holy shit, have we, man? Like we, seriously, dude, we have, and we've got to, we've got to, we've got to let the people know. We've got to <laughs> let people know which, what ruled, what sucked, and everything in the middle. We've, um, so, we, we've got to do a top ten eventually as well. Yeah, I think, I think we should pair them together. I think that'll be a great, a cool, great cool, one. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, our next episode right, well, won't have our Star Wars review. I think it'll be the one after that. Actually, yeah, I think we got to include Star Wars in that, don't we? Yeah. 
definitely. Yeah, it's it's like the the year hasn't ended until you've had a Star Wars movie. That's how it's been for the last five years. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna miss not having a Star Wars movie every year. I know I no. might be in the minority there, but no, I'm done with um, you. Yeah, it's cool to be excited for something. Yeah. Anywho, um, in the meantime, you guys can be excited for our, our Men in Black episode of Midnight Double Feature feature presentation, and that's us for tonight. Take care of yourselves. Say hi to your mum for me. Later's. Later.